Good evening, everyone, or morning, depending where in the world you're connecting from, and a very well, warm welcome to the final event in our short series about Hinkston Hall that we're calling Georgians, Jet Engines and Jeans. Tonight's event reveals the most recent chapter of Hinkston Hall's fascinating story, beginning with the landmark sequencing of the human genome 30 years ago that paved the way for the cutting edge biomedical research on site today including our contribution to the UK's crucial COVID-19 surveillance effort. My name is Julian Rayner, um, and I'm a white man in my very early 50s with short graying hair, if I'm honest, completely grey, and a very short beard. And if you'd like to address any questions to me tonight, my pronouns are he and his. I'm a genomics researcher. My lab works on how malaria parasites evolve, how they invade human red blood cells to cause disease, and how to stop them killing half a million children every year. But I also have the honor, and it's a really great honor, of being Director of Welcome Connecting Science. It's our goal at Connecting Science to enable everyone to explore genomics and its impact on research, health, and society. And we work with public audiences, with researchers, with healthcare professionals, to help people from all walks of life learn, discuss, and engage with genomics. We're based on the Welcome Genome Campus, which is situated just a few miles out of Cambridge in the United Kingdom and is home to two world leading research institutes, the Wellcome Sanger Institute and the EMBL European Bioinformatics Institute. In this campus, which is a dynamic place where more than 2000 people work, is focused on the science of genetics and genomics, which is very much all around us in the news right now with nonstop headlines about COVID-19 genome sequences, the variants that they encode and many of which were first identified right here by the Sanger Institute. This phase of the life on of the campus began 30 years ago with the arrival of the Sanger Institute. In the early 1990s, Sir John Sulston and his colleagues scouted the Cambridgeshire landscape for a potential home for the Human Genome Project. And they saw the potential of Hinkston Hall as the perfect environment in which to embark on that ambitious scientific endeavor, which we'll hear more about later. In fact, I and many members of my team are lucky enough to have offices inside Hinkston Hall itself. And this grade two listed stately home and its surrounding buildings have become a regular feature of working life on the campus. Connecting Science's courses and conferences program take place in what was part of the stable block, in formal parlors and dining rooms. And in fact, our auditorium is in what used to be the garden that grew the produce to feed the residents of the hall. It's still all too easy if you work here to take these incredible surroundings for granted. But a few years ago, just before the pandemic, I and some members of my team started to reflect more on the history that was contained within the walls of Hingston Hall and the wider estate. Over time, the grounds here have contained a fishing lodge, a stately home, an army billet, and a research laboratory for material science. But tonight we'll be exploring the contribution this space for science has made in the history of global health through DNA and discovery. We have a great online exhibition that begins to map the history of the hall, including many generous contributions from local residents and people who have worked here on life at the hall through the ages, as a family home, as part of the community, and as a home for science. And my colleague will post the link to this exhibition in the chat now. To increase access to the talk tonight, closed captioning is available for anyone experiencing barriers to the sound content. And we'll also include audio descriptions for anyone experiencing barriers to the visual content. At the bottom or top of your screen, depending on your device, you should be able to turn on the closed captions by clicking on the button that displays two letter Cs in it. Alternatively, you can go to the top of your screen and click on the live transcription link and it will take you to our transcription platform. To set the scene for the panel discussion tonight, we'll first show a short 12 minute film on the work we do at the Sanger Institute. And I will now provide a short audio description of that film. The voiceover is accompanied by photographs of the various people being referred to, some posing for the camera, and some of them at work, looking down microscopes and at computer screens, and spans historic images and more modern images. Panning aerial footage and images of Hingston Hall itself reveal a beautifully maintained red brick Georgian building and its more modern outbuildings set within acres of garden with rolling hills beyond. The film presents various interviewees, all staff and former staff from the Welcome Sanger Institute, whose stories interweave. 
Some are wearing lab coats and are sitting in laboratories, and some are in more informal settings. Their interviews are accompanied by numerous group photos of themselves and their teams in their younger years. And Dr. Cordelia Langford, who is part of the panel tonight, narrates part of the story in between the interviews. Archive film footage from 1997, entitled Quest for the Code of Life, shows Sir John Solston speaking in his lab, wearing his lab coat. And then another piece of archive footage entitled Book of Life shows a slightly older John Solston speaking in 2001. Dr. Langford then concludes her story. More recent BBC news clips lead to images of present day scientists working in gleaming state of the art laboratories. Credits at the end read, the voiceover is by Dr. Cordelia Langford. The film is directed by Colin Ramsey and ed edited by Daria Hupov and very special thanks are offered to the various contributors. Welcome Connecting Science is funded by Welcome and the film is produced by Dragonlight Films. The film will show now. When James Watson and Francis Crick, working with Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, unraveled the double helix structure of DNA in 1953, little did they know that their work had laid the foundation for a new age of molecular biology and ultimately the sequencing of the complete set of DNA within a human, the human genome. Many more researchers contributed to this journey adding knowledge around how genes are inherited and their roles in different organisms. In 1977, Fred Sanger and his colleagues developed a process called sequencing to actually read sections of DNA, identifying the precise four chemical codes of specific genes. Through the 1980s, this new sequencing technology was used to reveal the genomes of small organisms such as yeasts and nematode worms, honing and refining experimental approaches. In 1990, there was a significant scaling up in both ambition and organism size when plans to sequence an entire human genome were launched. Today at Hinkston on the outskirts of Cambridge, a group of scientists are engaged on a project of such significance it's been described as the biological equivalent of landing on the moon or splitting the atom. The Human Genome Project was a global collaboration with the UK arm funded by Wellcome and led by Sir John Sulston. It was John Sulston himself who discovered the former Tube Investments Research Laboratory site in Hinkston. It was in these buildings that a new team was recruited to form the core of what was then known as the Sanger Centre. This eventually developed into the Welcome Sanger Institute, and by the time the project was completed in 2003, the Institute had generated around 30% of the total DNA sequence of the human genome. Actually, at the time, we probably didn't realise how big a project it was going to be, sure. and probably the sort of foundations of what we have now, hmm. which is quite staggering, really. It's not been bad 25 years, has it, really? No, it's, it's been really good. Hopefully more to come. <laughs> My first involvement with the Human Genome Project actually went back to an aspiration when I was in my previous role. I, and I think a lot of other people, had heard about the Sanger Centre and, and really had, had, had a desire to, to want to work there. The reason for that is because we'd heard about this incredibly ambitious, possibly impossible project that was being undertaken and everyone that I knew wanted to be part of it. When we came in April of 1993, we were actually working on the yeast genome sequencing project, which we've been doing at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. And the work on the human genome project was founded on the yeast and the worm sequencing, which was the other two teams that were here on the site. Nancy and I came together in, mm. in April of that year. Yeah. Yes. I was 18, not long out of school and just trying to decide whether to go to university or not, but we came and worked here. So um, Carol was my first boss and mm. it, we had a really nice family feel here. Yeah, it was really small and everyone seemed to know everybody else, if not very well. And you knew who everybody yeah. was and, and what they were working on. Yeah. And you joined just after, didn't you? Sarah? I joined in November of 93. Yeah. Um, Carol, you weren't my boss at the time. I wasn't. <laughs> no. Sharon was. And, um, 
yeah, it was, it was, it was the, it was the family feel that made it special. I was 18 as well, straight out of school, and then my first job, and um, it was brilliant. <laughs> I didn't start right at the beginning. I joined in September 94. Still a very small team, certainly compared to today. Everybody that I met was really open, helpful, welcoming. John Salston was very, well, fun and engaging and encouraging and um, would stop and talk to, to absolutely anybody. And that, that was a real change because I'd worked in a couple of other research organisations which seemed to be much more hierarchical where you, you had to sort of almost bow and scrape to the to the professor or the, pe the people in charge. It just had a family feel, it was amazing uh, and because of the design of the building even though it was a really old building it was essentially a square so you could walk around and you'd always be bumping into people, always be talking. People were really friendly, that's one of the first things that I kind of noticed when I first started working here. They'd always talk to you and even though they're kind of really clever, a number of them really clever scientists, experts in their fields, they had no problem in kind of sharing their science with you. So we called it the fishbowl because it, all the people at the top used to look over and sort of see us down. The warehouse, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I remember the fishbowl quite a lot because we'd often get a lot of visitors come. I hadn't been here that long um, when we moved over to uh, Hinkston, and uh, John Tolston came in the lab with Bart Weld and, and he brought in um, Fred Sanger and we had Watson and Crick and Max Peruse and they all came in and I was busy in the lab with my headphones on singing away. And then it just had lots of partitions and so all the equipment was just in little areas and you'd just walk around to go to the next one. And the sequences were there as well so you'd be prepping something and then you'd go around load of sequence and but you could hear everything, you could talk to everyone and wave at the <laughs> people upstairs. Yeah. Um, it, it was quite a strange place. We used to yeah. celebrate people doing like one contig of work and we'd be like, well done, you've done that, it took you a month, that's brilliant. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then as, yeah. as time went on, it'd be like you'd be, you'd be able to do like um, 20 of those in a month. Mm -hmm. And um, and then obviously time went on and on. So yeah, celebrations now are for very big yeah. milestones, but they were quite small milestones in those days, but they were, they seemed big at the time, yeah. At they the time, were, we were just were, like, that's yeah. amazing, we're the first people who yeah. have done that. <laughs> I can remember when the draft of the human genome was published, John Salston himself said, this is just the, the beginning, it's, it's not the end point, this is the beginning of a huge amount of research because we have to work out what all of this data means, what, what does the sequence mean? The discovery of the sequence, the code of life, is only the beginning. It's very important to realise that it's, it's not the end of the process, it's only the end of the beginning. I think that this is certainly laying the foundations of a new biology of, and, and of new medical science. When they finally completed the draft of the Human Genome Project, um, they gave everyone on site who was involved um, some memorabilia to take with them. Now, I've got a couple of items with me here. One is this T-shirt which kind of marks the, the occasion for our human genome. But they printed all of the names of everybody on site at that time. So I'm here, I'm here somewhere, um, which was a really, really nice touch. So I've, I've kept that, I haven't worn it. One of the, the core principles was open sharing of, of the data. That really came into its own when, when it, it, it felt as though we'd, we'd entered a bit of a race to, towards the end because there was competition from the project that was being led by Craig Venter. And the ambition of that project was to privatise the, the genome, to benefit financially from it, to charge people to access. And so more effort was put into our side of the project to enable the ability to submit and complete the genome first so that it could be shared publicly for, for anybody to, to use. That core principle was established by John Salston and, and others. All of this should be in the public domain. It should not be something which is, is, is essentially based in profit making. Profit making may come into it for particular applications, but overall I think we need a public social welfare attitude to the use of this information. And I believe that we have to drive medicine forward in this way. And it's absolutely carried through as a golden thread, really through all of the years that I've certainly been working here. It's always been a principle that data, information, good practice, 
publications are shared with anybody so that all researchers around the world and you know, others can benefit from the work that is done here. We can reflect on the fact that it took us 10 years and, and billions, of, billions of dollars to sequence the first human genome and hundreds of people globally. Nowadays, with the next generation sequencing technology, it costs a few hundred dollars and, and human genomes, several thousand human genomes are sequenced here every week. Three more people have tested positive in the UK for coronavirus, with Northern Ireland confirming its first case tonight. A ninth person has tested positive for coronavirus in the UK. In 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic took hold across the world, the Sanger Institute became a key member of the newly formed COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, or COG UK. As part of COG UK, the Institute has adapted its DNA sequencing pipelines to undertake large-scale, rapid, whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for the pandemic. Demonstrating the ambition and innovation which also underpinned the Human Genome Project, the Institute has generated over 500,000 viral genome sequences, with more being produced every day. This data is freely available to researchers and healthcare professionals across the globe and has been used to understand viral transmission and evolution and to inform public health responses and vaccine development. You look at the site now, it's massive. It's completely changed from when I started to where it is now. And I think the historical aspect of what actually happened here and what was done has laid that foundation for where the campus is now and where it's going to go in the future. And I think it's really important that we remember those things and the people that gave their time. Um, it wasn't about earning a wage, it was always about advancing the science and making a difference. So I hope this film has given you some insight into the work we do at the Welcome Genome Campus. And just to add a personal note, I, I've had the joy of working on the campus for more than 13 years. And it's really quite a special and certainly very unique place. That's in part because of the beautiful grounds and architecture, but also because of the place that it has at the center of what was definitely a singular moment in scientific history, but also I think a singular moment in global history the moment when we as a species read our own genome for the first time and saw the instructions that make us human. And the role that the campus played in that story um, gives it to, to many scientists and, and certainly to me, almost a sense of pilgrimage, a sort of hallowed ground where something very special happened and is still happening with the amazing research that's going on there now. And there aren't many places like that and it's something really integral to the work we do in Connecting Science. The com campus has a really special atmosphere and a convening power that when you bring scientists or members of the public from all walks of life together here for conferences or workshops or training courses or public events, they feel connected to and immersed in something in a way that absolutely wouldn't happen if we were just another research building in the center of a busy city, be that Boston or Cambridge or Berlin. So to give you more insight into how the campus has become such a special place in the history of biological research, tonight we're joined by just an amazingly stellar panel of scientists and experts who will tell us about the history and future of genomics research here. Just before I hand over to our chair for the evening, I'd just like to take a moment to tell you about the format and briefly run through the event housekeeping. 
We respectfully ask everyone to participate in the spirit of curiosity and sharing, respecting different views, identities, and experiences. This platform is being moderated to ensure that it's a safe and inclusive space for everyone. Once I stop talking, the panel will chat for about 50 minutes and then hand over to question from you. And we'd really love your contributions. Please don't be shy. You'll see a Q&A box either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on the device you're using. And please type your questions in there at any point throughout the event, as soon as they occur to you. Don't worry if it looks like you're the only one asking a question. All of the questions come, into a, it come in a feed to us and my colleague is working behind the scenes to collate them so that we can cover as many topics as possible. Now, finally, it's enough from me, and I'd like, I'm delighted to hand over to Anjana Ahuja to introduce our panel in more detail. Anjana is a freelance, freelance science journalist and an award-winning columnist at the Financial Times. She also contributes to other outlets, including the New Statement, Statesman, and with Wellcome Trust Director Sir Jeremy Farrar, Anjana co-authored the Sunday Times 2021 bestseller, Spike, the Virus versus the People, The Inside Story, a behind the scenes account of the COVID-19 pandemic. She's a trustee of the charity Sense About Science, which champions the use of evidence in public life and a supporter of Speakers for Schools, which connects leading professionals to state school pupils. She has a PhD in space physics from Imperial College London, and I'm absolutely delighted that she's agreed to be the chair this evening. Over to you. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm Angela Ahuja. I am a science writer. I'm a middle-aged woman of Indian appearance with shoulder length dark hair. And if you'd like to address anything to me, my pronouns are she, her. So I'm really delighted to be chairing this event, DNA and Discovery this evening, with such a varied and knowledgeable panel. Mike Stratton, Cordelia Langford, Siggy Nepp, Jeff Barrett, and Jeremy Farrar. And one of the reasons that I'm so pleased to be doing it is because it's so unusual to be able to step back and think about the physical spaces where science happens. And that's odd really, because in other walks of life, the spaces where stuff happens really matters. And it's very easy to have deep and profound thoughts when you're looking up at the Sistine Chapel or in a cathedral. It takes you away from the ordinary and puts you into an extraordinary frame of mind. So by and large, uh, we don't think much about the spaces where science happens, unless they're monumental new buildings like the Crick, uh, which sits like a kind of lovely giant insect over North London. And I really do think that the best science spaces should inspire in the same way as mosques, temples and cathedrals. Uh, they should shift your frame of reference away from the ordinary and firmly into the realm of the extraordinary. So it's about fostering an environment where it's possible to think big new thoughts, to collaborate with others and to break new ground. And that's exactly what has happened at Hingston Hall since the 1990s, when it became the UK hub of the Human Genome Project, which really did feel at the time like a shoot for the moon project. We'll be taking all of those themes in with our panelists in turn, what the Human Genome Project is, was, why it ended up here at Hingston Hall, what makes a great scientific space from the perspective of both a scientist and an architect, the current genome sequencing work into COVID-19, and finally, some big thoughts of our own about where science and discovery is going next. So as Julian has said, um, I'll chat to each panelist for a few minutes and then we'll open it up to questions. And feel free to put questions in the chat box. Please don't be shy. Um, this is a great chance to ask questions of a really wonderful panel tonight. And staff behind the scenes will curate them and I'll, I'll put them to the panel on your behalf. 
So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Professor Sir Mike Stratton. So Mike Stratton is the director of the Wellcome Sanger Institute and chief executive officer of the Wellcome Genome Campus. His primary research interests have been in the genetics of cancer with early research focused on inherited susceptibility. Mike mapped and identified the major high-risk breast cancer susceptibility gene BRCA2, BRCA2, and other cancer susceptibility genes. And in 2000, Mike initiated the Cancer Genome Project at the Wellcome Sanger, which conducts systematic genome-wide searches for somatic mutations in human cancer. And Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but a somatic mutation is one that's acquired after birth rather than that's inherited. Cool. So Mike is a fellow of the Royal Society and he was knighted in 2013. So a very warm welcome to you, Mike. So to set the scene to kick us off, can you tell us why the scientists embarking on the Human Genome Project uh, came here to Hingston Hall? Thank you for that introduction, Ange. Um, I'm Mike Stratton. I'm a 64-year-old, bald, white male, and um, my pronouns are he and his. It was clear that once the thought of <clears throat> sequencing the whole human genome began to take hold, that a very large scale, this was going to be a very large scale project, and it would need a very large scale facility to deliver it. And um, <clears throat> John Sulston was a person who thought large. He was never afraid of doing that. And Welcome as an organization was also an organization that was happy to think large. And so they were looking for a place that they could construct really a large new facility, a facility that could be developed for the long-term future. And even remember at the time that they were looking, they didn't know how long it would take or what size of effort would be required for just the human genome. They started in 1993, and I think would have been surprised actually to be told it would only take seven years before the draft emerged. There were many uncertainties. All that they knew at the time was, this is the moment to start, but the way that the future would develop was unclear to them. So that was the first thing. They wanted a big place. I think the presence of the tube investments facility that had been there for a number of years, an industrial facility on, an, on the estate of an old English stately home, that helped the thought that this would be a place that science could continue to flourish. And I think they were also conscious that the type of science done at the Wellcome Genome Campus and at the Sanger Institute would be different, would be different from what was conventional in, conventional in most science institutes of the time. You could call it really a different culture of science, because this was going to be science that was composed of large teams of people working together with robots and computers in a huge coordinated and managed pipeline of data production, data analysis, data storage, data provision to the outside world. Really a kind of industrial production line in which processes were con constantly re-engineered, improved to achieve a single clear pre-stated goal. And in order to maximize the chances of such a new way of doing science, of making that a success, I think there was a sense that it would be a good thing to set it up in a different place from the usual centers of science. And so I think when they came across the Hingston Hall, Hingston Hall in its estate, I think it recommended itself to them in many different ways in that regard. For me, as a final piece of conjecture and um, the greatness of the choice, you know, Hingston Hall, obviously it's an English stately home, so it has a history, but the history of the campus goes back much further than that. There has been a settlement on the Hingston campus for 
5,000 years and there are Bronze Age and Anglo-Saxon and Roman skeletons that have been dug up. And I don't know whether John Sulston and his colleagues had that in their mind, but the sense of continuity with the origins of humanity and the development, the thread continuing to that cutting edge of technology and human insight really that led to the historic human genome, that to me is an uplifting thought about and feeling about the campus too. That's amazing. So it's a, it's a very symbolic site as well as being an incredible sort of, you know, site to look at. So what did the Human Genome Project achieve? Well, the shortest form of the answer to your question is that the Sanger Center sequenced one third of the human genome, as you already heard, making it publicly available to any, for anybody to use. So it did the six chromosomes that one way or another it had been allocated. The long ans longer answer is that the advent of the human genome sequence fundamentally changed the face of biological science. And it did this in many, many different ways. And I'll give you just two examples. So one specific example of this is just to convey the nature of the change that it almost brought almost immediately. You know, we previously didn't know how many genes there were in the human genome. And because of that, we didn't know how many proteins there were. And the proteins are the moving parts of the cellular machine. So in our previous efforts to understand and then to modify the behavior of the human cellular machinery in medicine, we were like car mechanics that were working without a knowledge of the parts list or even the numbers of parts of the car that we were working on, working in the dark. And in fact, many of uh, you know, the, the PhD students that sit with us today, they, they look at us old timers and they say, well, how are you able to do anything realistically interesting or insightful before you had the human genome sequence? Well, that changed dramatically with the advent of the sequence because we now knew that there were 20,000 genes, although truth to tell, we're not sure still what those many of those 20,000 genes actually do. And that just that number of 20,000 stopped us, many of us in our tracks and reset our thinking because we already knew that the first animal to be sequenced, the worm, Cynorhabditis elegans, which is just a millimeter long and with just about a thousand cells, it also has 20,000 genes. So all our conceptions of life and how it worked were being changed really day on day by the human genome sequence and then its comparison to other things. So that's one example of how that changed things almost immediately. But in the wider sense, the advent of the human genome sequence converted biology from a small data science into a big data science. The human genome has 3000 million letters of DNA code. And to give you a sense of what that is equivalent to, it's equivalent to 10,000 copies of a small paperback like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the, to the Galaxy, which is the one that I compared it to. So it's 10,000 copies of that. And so there's a huge amount of data in just one human genome. And that data and the fact that we now generate one of those genomes every few minutes at the Sanger Institute, it's changed the way that science, biological science was done, bringing in computational scientists and you know, a whole new different way of thinking about biology. So that's, that's what was achieved. Thank you, Mike, for setting the scene. That's 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 brilliant. Um, so we're now going to meet one of the stars um, of that film that we saw earlier, uh, Dr. Cordelia Langford, who can pick up some of those themes. Someone who's been working at the at the, the front line of the science. She can tell us uh, through first-hand experience about collaboration in science and what makes a great environment for scientific endeavour and discovery. 
So let me introduce Cordelia. Dr. Cordelia Langford is the Director of Scientific Operations at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. With almost 30 years of experience working in the fields of genomics, uh, Cordelia is responsible for the direction and delivery of high quality data and resources by the Sanger Institute's core scientific pipelines, directing 300 technical experts, scientists and managers across the Institute, as well as uh, liaising with key external partners and suppliers. Her first role at Sanger was flow sorting human chromosomes destined for sequencing in the Human Genome Project. And Cordelia's role has scaled up as, Sk as Sanger has taken on new projects and challenges, such as the UK Biobank whole human genome sequencing effort, and more recently, the COVID-19 viral sequencing pipeline. And finally, Cordelia has a PhD in molecular cytogenetics, uh, is an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, and was named one of the 50 top movers and shakers in UK bio business in 2018. So Cordelia, what was it like in the early days and how far back are we going when we say the early days? Are we back in the 1990s? <laughs> Thank you, Ange, for that very kind introduction. And um, I'll just take a moment to, to describe myself. I'm a mid fifties cis white woman with short graying brown hair which is tucked behind my ears. And um, my pronouns are she, her. So um, indeed, uh, to answer your question, I just had my 27th anniversary at the Sanger. And um, it, it feels as though, um, I, I've, uh, it, it doesn't feel as though I've actually been working here for, for 27 years, but it's, it's been an extraordinary journey. And, um, there are, there are a number of differences um, that I can uh, reminisce about uh, in the, the sort of the early days com compared to now, but um, I can still remember my very first day when I, when I first started at, at the Sanger and, and I, I was introduced into that very tube in the, that, the building, the tube investments building that we've seen photos of in the film earlier and that Mike just described. And um, we've, we've heard mention of a feel of family um, it, there was a relatively small group. I think I was employee number 71, something like that. Um, but there was there was a lovely buzz about the place. And some of that I think I brought with me because I was so excited to, to be to be there, to be joining and to be part of uh, the, the project, the Human Genome Project. But also um, it was the fact that everybody that I seemed to meet um, was welcoming, very friendly, wanted to, to help out, um, really interested and keen to describe the work that they were doing. Um, but the, the sort of the sense of family feel was really um, solidified for me when I was um, shown, um, shown into the, the little stores room um, on my first day and bumped into someone who'd actually been a really good friend of mine at junior school. And, uh, and so it, it, it sort of um, felt wonderful to have, to have that connection, actually, to, to my childhood. <laughs> and tell us about the space, Cordelia. How does the space that you were in foster that collaboration? And, and I mean, I hear in the film people talked about the fishbowl, for example. <laughs> the, the space, um, part, part of um, the fact that, that the... The labs and the offices actually in the original tube investments building were, were built around pretty much around a square shape. And so um, you, you, you sort of um, if you wanted to, to go out and, and go and um, meet or talk to somebody, you, you pretty much had to follow a, a similar route. Um, that it, it was it was easy to, to get help from from people because it, it felt as though you could actually step out into a corridor and you bump into someone who would who would know the answer to your problem. The uh, we we we've heard in the film how the um, central area where most of the sample prepping and the sequencing actually took place was was indeed nicknamed the fishbowl. And it was for a couple of reasons. It was a it was a large open plan lab that um, where where people could see each other and hear each other. So there was really a lot, a lot of noise going along, a, a lot of communication. But there was also this overhead sort of mezzanine walkway 
and in, and there were a lot of visitors and um, the thing was that when visitors came they were taken up onto the onto the mezzanine walkway and then looked down into this lab which then gave the feel of, 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 of a fishbowl and that's really why it got the nickname but it was uh, thought of and uh, with with very fond memories the space played a really huge part in fostering collaboration and, and really embedding that sense of team spirit. And do, do you think that if Hinkston was right in the middle of Cambridge, it would have the same feel and would you get the same science done? Well, Cambridge is, of course, is an amazing place because uh, there are an incredible number of, of very knowledgeable and, and intellects and uh, a huge drive for, for science. Um, it, it's um, that there, there's probably something I know. I know some of the people who who work at Sanger today might complain a little bit about feeling as though geographically it's a little bit isolated, but actually there's there's something really special and really magical about the entire campus. Um, it's it's already been mentioned this evening about the fact that it's a beautiful landscaped ground. There are really fantastic, well-designed buildings that just foster team spirit, collaboration, and um, I'd, I'd argue that it would be difficult uh, to, to actually uh, do the sort of work that we do collectively anywhere else. Thanks so much Cordelia for, for telling us what it's been like to work there for so long that you don't really don't look as though you've been working there for that long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, you. Um, so let's move on to the architectural spaces created at the Welcome Genome Campus, including the Conference Centre and the Solston Building and Labs, and thoughts on how the spaces we make can influence what happens inside them. So I'm delighted to introduce Siggy Nepp, an interior architect at Abel Nepp Architects, who has led uh, the interiors on several projects at the Welcome Genome Campus, including the Conference Centre, the Mulberry Residences, the Salston Building for the, um, for the Sanger Institute, and the EBI EMBL South Building, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get on to. Siki studied at the Bartlett School of Architecture at the University College London, and has worked with a long list of prestigious uh, academic, scientific, and research institutions throughout her career. And her approach to design is collaborative, working with clients to think outside the box. Um, so, Siggy, I know you, you've got something in mind you'd like to share with us, how you've got involved, how it's developed. So over to you, please. Thank you, Ange, um, for a great introduction. Um, good, evening, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Ziggy Knapp. I'm a white middle-aged woman with brown hair and answer to the pronouns uh, she or her. Tonight, I'd like to focus on the design of the social engagement spaces on the campus, um, which I was involved with um, Able Knapp through 2016 and which is so important uh, to a successful science community. Abel Nepp started working with the campus in 2009 and completed several projects, each one uh, having its own unique criteria, cultural character, context and concept. As a result, um, the buildings and spaces are all very different in look and feel but offer the opportunities for learning, connection, um, and international collaboration, so in essential in today's space for science. The following slides show some examples of the differing design journeys that occurred through our close collaboration with the clients and the users. Slide one, uh, audio description. The concept image showing the roof plan view of the kitchen garden, now the conference centre site, and the orientation of the garden walls referencing the original sundial concept. I hope everybody can see that. The idea for what was known to us um, at that time, uh, with the kitchen garden project, now the conference centre, started off referencing the heritage of the site as a Victorian kitchen garden with a symbol of a sundial to reference the orientation and seasons that affected what would be the typical planting at that period, in particular 
the notable traditional passion for espalier training. Slide two, audio description. Sorry, just hit that again. It, it's an image showing examples of the phylogenetic trees which were referenced in the artwork to the wall of the auditorium and a photographic view of the curved wall to the auditorium within that space, showing a detail of the perforated artwork metal panels. This initial concept led to the development of the spoke-like roof structure, which you can see, as well as the large scale artwork on the internal drum. An intense creative collaboration with a team of scientists led by Julian Rayner, um, ourselves and artist Timorous Beasties resulted in an exciting fusion of art and science, giving the building a true sense of place and a strong link to the client's culture. Slide three, audio description. A photographic view of the conference center bar, a seating area adjacent to the curved wall of the auditorium within the open plan main space. The conference center now offers the opportunity for learning and collaboration within a flexible range of settings. And with the addition of the bar, those social connections can happen within a more intimate and comfortable space. Moving on to our second project, uh, which is the EMBL uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, Institute in the South Building, which was the second phase of the Southfield expansion at the campus. Slide four, audio description, a photographic view looking at the central atrium space of the EBI EMBL building, showing the circulation routes and adjacent glass studio offices. There is also wooden panelling and glass balustrading. The spatial layout of the build of the South Building evolved from the client's aspiration to optimise collaboration and transparency in their way of working. In response, our interiors concept considered how movement through the building could help engineer chance encounters and social gathering, as well as connectivity with the views into the working spaces and longer vistas through the length and the height of the building. Social Siggy. areas. Sorry, Siggy, can yeah. I jump in? And it's, I, because we don't have much time left for your slides, but. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering that you, you and actually lots of other people have talked about serendipity. So that's really important, I guess, in these spaces for scientists. It's very key. Um, I think uh, creating or engineering that those happenings of, of sort of collaboration and social gathering. Um, it's when ideas are exchanged um, and when discoveries are made. So um, our, our, our aim in, in, in all of the projects actually uh, was to try uh, and encourage that. Um, That's br brilliant. I'm going, to, I'm going to move on if I may. That's fine, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's great, Siggy, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving. And it's really lovely to have a visual handle with those slides actually of what it looks like because confession, I've never been to Hingston Hall. Um, and and I, I must go there, especially that bar. It's beautiful. So thank you, Siggy. We'll come back onto that later. And I now want to bring in Dr. Jeff Barrett, uh, who can bring us right up to date by telling us about the COVID-19 sequencing efforts at the Sanger and the impact this work is having on all levels of society from our everyday lives to the global understanding of infectious disease. So to introduce Jeff, Jeff is director of the Welcome Sanger Institute's COVID-19 genomics initiative, which sequences and analyzes uh, samples from positive tests around the UK in near real time, which helps to guide the public health response to local outbreaks. Prior to that, Jeff worked in both industry and academia, studying the genetic basis of human diseases, and most recently was the chief scientific, sorry, chief, the chief scientific officer at Genomics PLC. He's been a group leader, um, sorry, he was a group leader at the Sanger Institute for 10 years, where he focused on the genetics of inflammatory and neurodevelopmental diseases. He's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. So Jeff, um, can you tell us uh, please about how the Sanger Institute is contributing to the national sequencing efforts 
on COVID-19. Yes, thanks, Ange. Uh, I'm a white, uh, middle-aged, bald man with a beard, uh, and that my pronouns are he and his. Um, we, as um, I think was briefly alluded to in the video, uh, joined an initiative set up very early in the pandemic by Professor Sharon Peacock from Cambridge and others uh, called COG UK to use genome sequencing to track how the virus evolves and spreads around the country and around the world. As we probably all know by now, the virus is you know, encoded by just 30,000 letters of RNA, and that's what's causing all these problems. And there are sometimes um, kind of spelling errors in that. And when we see them, most of the time they do nothing. Sometimes they do things that change the virus's biology. And so by sequencing lots and lots, we can both read it as a kind of barcode to see what's happening and also learn when the virus is beginning to change, which has happened a couple of times. Sanger, as Mike alluded to, really tried to do what it was built to do, which was set up something very big and do a kind of high throughput factory-like approach to sequencing viral genomes. So we partnered with the big testing labs around the country and, and really focused on just taking samples randomly selected and doing as many as we can to give a very rich and detailed picture of this the evolution of the virus. And we've in fact done uh, just as of, I think this week, over 1 million virus genomes that we have sequenced, analyzed, given to the UK Health Security Agency, put into the public domain. And if you actually look at what the, to that number, that publicly shared number for the whole world is 5 million. So Sanger has done one in five of the SARS-CoV-2 genomes in the world. That is absolutely incredible. I mean, what's it like to be part of it? It's been uh, a great privilege to kind of take something that, um, you know, is the area I'm trained in. And when this pandemic happened to say, this is relevant, what we can do will help us understand this in, in some small way and hopefully make a contribution to help um, leaders make better decisions. And so that opportunity, I felt very grateful to have had a chance to make a contribution and actually hearing the stories about the early days of the Institute and the campus in the Human Genome Project, I think this really um, brought back some of that feeling because so many people, especially early on, when a lot of research had been shut down because of the national lockdowns, volunteered to come in and do any part in making this huge thing happen. So for example, we have hundreds of thousands of these samples that are shipped to us every week and people need to just literally lift crates off fans move them into big walk-in freezers, ship them up to the labs. And so many people just put their hands up to say, I want to help. And that was a really amazing thing that we got this whole thing kind of up and running in the middle of the pandemic. That's amazing. And, and tell me just very briefly before we, we finish with your um, contribution, your high point and your low point. What you I, th I think... Um, in a way they're tied together because they were the moments when we realized that early on we were kind of pushing a rock uphill to say this is worth doing and then it was it was unfortunate because the virus a couple of times in the uk evolved that changed the pandemic a lot into the alpha variant sort of late last year and the delta variant that was then imported this year and in both those times the data we were generating were in the hands of decision makers to hopefully bring forward kind of key decisions by even a few days or maybe a week. And in the pandemic, even those short times where they could understand what was happening and therefore what needed to be done just that much faster can actually save thousands of lives, I think, because, you know, we know these exponential curves move so fast that those short times um, make a huge difference. And those were really terrifying in one sense to kind of see this thing coming really before even anyone else was aware of what was happening but then also to realize that the work we had done had made a difference. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Jeff, for, for setting the scene with, with COG and the COVID sequencing. Um, so last, but uh, most definitely not least, um, I would like to bring in Jeremy Farah. Hello, Jeremy, it's lovely to see you again. Um, who can share his thinking on global health challenges and how genomics can contribute to both human and planetary health in the future. So to give him his full introduction, Dr. Je Dr. Jeremy Farrah is director of the Wellcome Trust, the world's second largest independent charitable foundation, and obviously has a focus on improving human health through research. 
Uh, Jeremy trained as a doctor and before joining Wellcome in 2013 was director of the clinical research unit at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in Vietnam, where he focused on emerging infectious diseases uh, and their impact on global health. He is more garlanded than I, could, I have time for uh, to, to list you. He's been listed in the Fortune list of the 50 world's greatest leaders. Um, uh, he's got medals galore from the government of Vietnam uh, and was knighted in 2019 for services to global health. He's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, um, the UK European Molecular Biology Organization, the National Academies in the USA and a fellow of the Royal Society. So Jeremy, a basic question to start with, how does genomics contribute to our understanding of human health and disease? Thanks, Hunt. <clears throat> it is great to see you. Um, <laughs> we must catch up in person at some point. I'd, so sure. my name's Jeremy Farrer. I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'd like to think a middle-aged white male. I'm pleased to say um, I have all my own hair um, and I'm not bald, uh, born in Singapore. And um, yeah, please address me as, as uh, he or his. Um, and it is a huge pleasure to join. So, and it's been brilliant to listen to. In fact, it, I don't know about everybody else, but I, I, I was quite emotional listening and watching all of that. Um, and, and before I answer your question, I, we, we, need, we must pay a huge tribute to Cordelia and everybody else in that film, but also people in our positions a decade, two decades, three decades ago, because I think Mike said it really beautifully. You, you know, these people were reaching for the stars. They were setting big ambitions. They were changing the world. Um, it's changed the whole of biology, what's happened on this campus. And uh, that's, uh, that makes you feel really quite emotional. Um, all the way through to what Jeff was describing just there. So um, just staggering, actually. It almost does bring a tear to your eye. Um, so it's helping us in real, in real time with the, the COG UK, the COVID sequencing. Well, let, let, let's, let's look ahead a bit. Um, at, what are the big global challenges ahead? Yeah. Well, firstly, I think genomics is it, it's changed biology and it's changed the whole of human, but we shouldn't forget animal and agriculture health as well. Um, biodiversity. This is going to shed light on on the whole of biodiversity globally um, through things like the tree of life, which is sort of getting going now on the campus. Um, and if we look at the great challenges, I think, of the 21st century, I mean, I think there's there, there's a few things which are critical and actually get to the very heart of of the campus and the Welcome Sanger Institute, that, that many of them are going to be transnational. Um, we are in a very, very small world and it, it's just one world. Uh, we don't have another one. Um, and the great challenges of the 21st century are going to be defined by, by frankly, that smallness, that what happens in Wuhan in December 2019 will be in London or New York or Geneva or Lagos in February or March of 2020. So, you know, the world is very small. Um, and I think all of the major challenges are going to be transnational. Uh, they are all, I think, going to have science as some part of the solutions to them. Um, but they're also going to need that science to be part of the societies that we're all part of, because there's no, there's little point just having science, which doesn't then enhance, improve, and isn't part of the societies and the communities that we all are part of and which allows science to thrive. So, and I think if we take that at the heart of it, then the very drive, the very emotion of the campus and the Sanger Institute that Cordelia was talking about, puts it at the heart of trying to provide some of the answers to those challenges, whether they're pandemics, drug resistant infections, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, equitable access to the benefits of vaccines and things. Sanger is at the heart of all of that. And um, I mean, it's just incredibly proud to be in some way linked with it. I mean, it's remarkable to hear Jeff talk about one in five of the genomes, <laughs> the SARS-CoV-2 genomes have been sequenced at Sanger, which I never knew. I mean, that's <laughs> really, that really is staggering, to be honest. But obviously, it's one bit of a global story. Um, and I'm just wondering how, given that you talked about these challenges being transnational, global, we've got problems with equity, we know, um, how do how does welcome how does how does how do governments how do they best support innovation and discovery to to kind of step up to those challenges um 
really good question. I, I, I think that, that what we must appreciate is that what Jeff was doing, and Jeff would be probably the very first person to say that, has built on decades of investment by governments, by welcome, by others in basic science, in discovery science. It's, it's, it's at the bedrock of everything that's done. And then great people in great teams, diverse teams in good environments, the campus, um, are then given the freedom to, to follow their dreams and their ideas. Some of them, they'll all be brilliant. Some of them won't work. Many of them won't work. Being a scientist is a very frustrating endeavor. Uh, but some of them will work and some of them uh, will change the world. And the fact that Jeff can say that one in five of all COVID genomes around the world has been done on that campus is extraordinary. Um, absolutely extraordinary. That Mike can say one third of the human genome was done on campus is an extraordinary statement. And if, if I could pick one thing out from what John Sulston, who was a, just a brilliant mind, one thing he said, this is about social welfare. This is about making science open. It's not for scientists, it's for the whole of society. And that ethos runs right the way through the campus, right the way through Welcome. And I think was perhaps arguably one of the greatest contributions of everybody on the campus and everybody at Welcome. And that changed the world. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, we're going to pick up those themes, I'm sure, in the Q&A, which is coming next. So panelists, please be ready. Um, viewers, please jump in to the chat box and the Q&A, sorry, the Q&A with your questions. Um, and we'll pick up some of those and we'll put them to the panelists. Uh, we have about 20 minutes now. Um, so we're gonna get going. And the other thing I was gonna say, if panelists would like to jump in at any point, please do. So uh, let me go to the Q&A now. Um, now, really interesting one, actually, given what you've said, Jeremy, uh, about, uh, about kind of being open and people working together. In fact, in many ways, COVID has closed things down and made us retreat uh, into our own kind of little communities. Um, uh, but for Ziggy, COVID is obviously a challenge now uh, in terms of building environments that work in the COVID era. So how, how, how have you changed the way you design environments that, you know, given that many of us are hybrid working now, um, Siggy, what, what, what impact has COVID had on, on your design uh, briefs? Uh, since um, uh, you know, since the lockdowns have been lifted, um, there has been a partial return um, back to um, you know buildings and offices, um, and uh, I think it's been important for people to get that social interaction again, that face-to-face -face meeting. Um, uh, you know, it, it, so what what's happened, I think, is is more of a focus, a holistic. Um, experience when you go into buildings, um, more social areas, uh, people treating, uh, you know, the, the, the buildings as hubs um, to come in and exchange ideas, to come and uh, talk about things. Um, so lots more meeting areas um, and, and sort of social support areas. And those presumably are already built into Hinkston. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, every project that we worked on has its own distinct, um, uh, you know, uh, areas. Um, uh, but yes, all, all of, uh, you know, uh, incorporated that. So whether it's cafes, whether it's meeting rooms, and even, you know, uh, f physically, um, you know, materials have sort of uh, become transparent just to allow people windows on, on people, you know, doing their stuff, working. So, you know, it's breaking barriers down. Back to the goldfish bowl in a smaller, <laughs> smaller scale. Uh, we had another question, which was uh, from an anonymous attendee. And I, I think maybe Mike and Cordelia might be best for this one. Did the Hinkston setup um, come as a concept from the foundations laid by other British scientists in the 70s and 80s who worked at Oxford? And I'm guessing the, what the questioner is, is uh, alluding to maybe you know this idea of a campus apart somewhere separate somewhere sort of very dedicated um do we know why sir john sauston kind of hit on 
Pinkston Hall as a, as a good place. How, did he have the idea that he, maybe he'd seen it from somewhere else? Um, well, I'm not sure about the, 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 the Oxford component of that. <laughs> and, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. but I think, um, um, as I said, I think he was looking for, a, he understood that there was going to be something different about the science and he wanted it to be separate from the conventional centers of, of, of science. And so he did go looking elsewhere. The, the, the legend is that he did explore up in Scotland at one point and um, even saw something there that uh, caught his eye. But in the end, he was drawn back like a, you know, an iron filing to a magnet back to close to Cambridge. So um, I, I, well, I, Cordelia, maybe you can speak further on it. Um, but I, yeah, I think those were the reasons for going for a big sort of rural mm. place like that. Interesting. Cordelia, it's, um, do, do, can you think of anywhere when you started in the 90s that it that Hingston could be compared to? Um, it, uh, I would have struggled to, actually. I, um, I have to reiterate this sense that it really felt as though I was part of something that was entirely unique and, and what evolved, albeit growing from this slightly dilapidated factory, also felt really unique. On a practical level, I suspect that an element of, of the decision was a combination of space to, uh, to allow for growth. Um, it was proximal to the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, where of course, John Salston at the time was, was working and his original lab was, was based, but also the, the fantastic setting. I, I, I struggle to think that there were that many other places with the proximity to, to the sort of the core labs with such an amazing setting that also provided that, that sense of growth. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cordelia. We have a question from Katrina. Jeff, Cordelia, Mike and Jeremy have all been heavily involved in the COVID pandemic. How have previous collaborations supported our efforts and how difficult would it have been to respond presumably to this pandemic without that previous, uh, without those previous uh, collaborations? Well, I think they've been absolutely essential. And I would just echo a comment Jeremy made that the kind of COVID genomics response that's been possible on the campus is entirely enabled by all of these different components, both really locally on the campus, the investment in the infrastructure and, and the way that it can work at scale, but also, you know, nationally and internationally with how to kind of, you know, how close knit the kind of network of scientists interested in these problems is. And uh, Jeremy, you may have been in the room, I wasn't at the time, but this early meeting that happened in like March, or so, it was that welcome actually, now that I, I've heard the story, you know, that happened so fast in the grand scheme of things that people came together, you know, the British government found some investment to get it going. Those kind of things were because that network and, and interaction already existed before the pandemic. And I, I think, you know, you can also see that globally as kind of, you know, there's a, a what was previously a somewhat niche camaraderie of people interested in the genomes of infectious diseases around the world that was the beginning of the network that helped not just you know support the big effort at Sanger but many many now there are you know pretty much every country in the world is is doing some version of this tracking of the virus by sequencing can i add to that oh yes, sorry please do please do um, i was going to say um actually just to to, sh to, to refer back to Jeff's comment that I was I was privileged to, to be in that meeting at, at Welcome uh, right right at the start and I agree it's the um, it, it turns out everyone was there except for me so I don't know why I'm talking about <laughs> well we we did our best without you Jeff but um, the uh, something else that I I'd love to acknowledge which which also relates to collaboration was the incredible openness and uh, generosity of, of, of some commercial suppliers. So uh, because of our infrastructure, we, we actually have close working partnerships with, with a number of commercial suppliers. And the, uh, 
the, the, the process of, of facing the pandemic in a way uh, drove our partnerships even closer because a number of, of suppliers just sort of uh, got in touch and said, what can we do to help you? They weren't worried about profit. It was all about joining forces, joining in innovative ideas, co-developing reagents and, and actually tweaking hardware to, to help us at Sanger get underway to be able to sequence the, the, the genomes at the sort of scale that we anticipated we really would need to. So I was really keen to throw that in as well. In some I... senses, sorry, who, who wanted to come in there? Um, I, I would like to echo that and also the, you know, it was obviously a time of crisis and a real emergency, but everybody put their hand to the tiller and, you know, the, the laboratories that were doing the testing, you know, hundreds of thousands of tests each day. We couldn't have set up this whole um, coronavirus sequencing on our own because we didn't have the raw materials. So we went to each of those lighthouse laboratories and said, look, would you give us your waste materials? Just give us those and we'll take it on from there. And remarkably, they all said, absolutely, just take them. If you're going to do something good, take them and do it. None of the obstacles that we often get in these sort of circumstances, they just said, get on with it. Ethical issues, you know, regulatory issues, they were dealt with immediately. There was a tremendous um, positivity and drive to do something useful for the pandemic that we were the beneficiaries of, but also obviously could contribute on the back of. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on. We've got a couple of, it, quite a few more questions actually. Um, uh, let's see uh, who would like to take this one. So does the panel foresee the research being done at the Wellcome uh, Genome Campus? continuing being open and shared among scientists, even though there may be um, economic interest in, in the applications. Um, so this goes back, I guess, this references what Sir John Salston said about this idea of having very, you know, public, this is a, a social welfare um, endeavor in a way. Um, do you think that would ever change? Uh, and maybe I would like to ask um, Jeremy here. I can't see it changing in any near time in the future. Um, no, I can't, because if you look at the two founding institute, well, not the, the two cornerstone institutes on the campus, the Wellcome Sanger Institute and their um, brother or sister, um, the European Bioinformatics Institute, both of them have running all the way through everybody in the organizations, this commitment to um, open science, to sharing uh, and, and the public good. Um, uh, it is also true that on campus, in, increasingly in the future, there will be great spin outs from there um, because, because science has to be open, um, but then science also needs translating into things, drugs, vaccines, diagnostic tests, whatever it is, technology. And that requires a combination of partnership which takes you into the commercial sector. I see that as wholly positive, uh, an ecosystem that will allow all of that to go on. But there's no doubt the Wellcome Sanger Institute and EBI will continue to be absolutely committed to open science um, and the sharing of information. Yeah, cannot see that ever changing. Mike, would you like to? I would completely add... echo. <clears throat> yeah, no, thanks. I would completely echo what Jeremy said the spirit of science, the spirit of the NBOL European Bio Bioinformatics Institute, absolutely towards generating data, generating science that is then out there for everybody to see. But that science needs to be taken forward. And in fact, that's part of the kind of the, the, the joy and glory of the campus development that we are now envisaging. 30 years after the Hingston campus was first bought, we're looking forward to an expansion of the campus to about three times its size and three times the number of people, all under that strap line of genomes and biodata and a considerable proportion of that expansion is going to be in the form of commercial entities that are going to come in using the expertise, the skills, the infrastructure of the campus to develop new drugs, new diagnostics on the basis of this skills and the 
the knowledge that goes into genomes and biodata. And one of the, you know, one of the areas of real development will be, yes, that public spirit, but then bringing in the commercial entities, infecting them with some of that public spirit as they have all adopted. You know, many of the large scale sequencing initiatives that have been conducted recently have been partly funded by, by um, commercial enterprises. So it's all working pretty well and will continue to do so. It's a long way, isn't it, from back in the 1990s when I remember just starting out as a science journalist when it was pretty much um, the public effort versus Craig Venter who wanted to commercialise things. And um, it's really interesting that, that what you say, Mike, about this idea of the public good, and Jeremy, you, you've said that. Um, I want to move on to some other questions. Um, actually, I want to bring Siggy in, actually, just, just briefly, when we talked about, you know, the, the, the campus, are there any comparable campuses that you can think of that kind of, you know, try to achieve the same things that you've worked on elsewhere? Um. Well, to be honest, no, because it has um, a unique setting. It has a fantastic setting. Um, and, uh, you know, the calibre uh, that we were forced to uh, provide um, <laughs> in terms of um, design, I mean, you know, the collaborations were so intense, I remember, on, on many of the projects, um, because we all wanted to come up with, um, you know, buildings that, uh, could house an identity, the identity of um, the specific uh, group of scientists, um, you know, a, a building that they could engage with um, uh, and, and get stimulated by. So um, I think that campus is fairly unique uh, in, in that sort of collection of projects that we were involved with. So uh, I think it's and is, is one, yeah. Sorry, is flexibility a watchword? Because I'm thinking, you know, there's that great quote, isn't there, by Christopher Wren, architecture is for eternity. But, you know, Mike's talked about expanding, um, you know, you, you're always having to put new machines in, do new things. So is one of the keys to, to making a successful science space flexibility? Do you have to build that into the fabric? I think that there is an element of flexibility, especially as um, you know, young companies come and go uh, or move to bigger premises. So, um, it, it, you know, in terms of the technical um, side of things, um, uh, yes, you know, uh, pe people do want to be able to pick up their stuff and move to uh, another uh, building as they grow. Um, but then there's a fine balance in that because um, you can then start to produce more speculative, um, uh, you know, uh, buildings, which can become a bit bland. Um, and then, you know, you kind of lose that, um, you know, that really unique uh, environment for, for people to engage in. So, um, yeah, I think there's a there's a fine balance, uh, you know, between that word flexibility, which can then sort of you know, it, it sort of has an impact on uh, the, the design, you know, the uniqueness of the design. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And the one word that I would never uh, describe Hingston as is bland from the pictures we've seen. It's really quite stunning. Um, I want it's to hard take... work to get there. It's hard <laughs> work to create something, you know, uh, unique. Um, there's a lot more, uh, you know, a lot sort of uh, more intense design uh, collaboration. But when you get there, it's worth it. <laughs> um, I want to ask, uh, and perhaps this maybe Mike, Jeremy, Jeff, uh, Cordelia, do you envisage that COVID will stay an issue for, for the Welcome Sanger Institute and Hingston Hall in the long term? It's a good question. Um, well, we envisage as much as anybody can that the pandemic will continue and that the coronavirus will stay with us as you know, it'll join the pantheon of viruses that afflict us every year. And I think that our experience over the last 18 months has shown a completely, well, 
has shown what can be developed if you are, have to put your head to it to manage pandemics in this way, right across the spectrum from testing to, to sequencing. And that has changed, I think, the government and the um, public health authorities' vision of what needs to happen in the future. So we envisage that there will be large-scale sequencing of viruses as a long-term initiative, really at a much greater scale than ever was in the past. And how that will take place, where it will take place, that's yet to be seen, but we believe we will be contributing to that for certainly a couple of years, and that it would be perfectly reasonable for a, a long-term facility to be established on our campus, possibly for the UK government, to look to deliver that over the long-term future. Wow, so that's, that's looking far ahead. I'm going to put the last question, I think, to Cordelia, um, which will bring us round in a lovely circle from the film and, and, and given you, you know, you've been Cordelia on, on that campus for so long, there's a question here for you. How much do you think the original DNA of the way the campus was set up for the Human Genome Project, which was about massive projects and big teams working together and was very different to how, from how biological research operated then, is still present in the way the campus feels today. Does it still feel like the same place? I'm thinking, I think that's what the questioner uh, is getting at. Thank you. I, I think that's a lovely question. And there's a there's a very short answer, which, which is yes. Um, actually, I could expand just a tiny bit by, by actually saying that I, I feel as though, um, certainly in terms of similarities, that um, this, this vision of incredibly ambitious scientific endeavor has been a thread it's been the dna all the way through we, we're encouraged as individuals and as teams to uh, think the unthinkable to try and solve really ambitious problems and um that's that's what makes us tick sometimes and i'd, I'd love to refer back to jeff's comment earlier just in the last couple of years the fact that uh, a group of people, group of thought leaders got together really early in the pandemic and, and, and got together and said, what is it that we could do to contribute our knowledge, to, to try and help uh, contribute to, to solving or managing the problem? And um, the pandemic, in a way, and the, the way that we've responded to it at Sanger has, has empowered all sorts of new ways of working, of, of, of prioritising, of... Um, of developing and making brand new laboratory processes really quickly. And um, we, we've actually learned so much and benefited so much from it. That, um, but, but it is because this, uh, th this collegiate work, amazing people coming together, um, working towards and, and hopefully achieving a, a shared and common goal. That's brilliant. Thank you, Cordelia. That's really given us a great kind of circular kind of way back into where we started, which was the history of Hingston Hall. And we brought it bang up to date with Siggy, Mike and um, Jeremy and Jeff and, and, and yourself. That's fantastic. So I'm really sorry if your question didn't get answered. I understand that there may be a possibility of following up later on. Um, so perhaps uh, someone behind the scenes can get your question answered. Um, but I want to thank the panel now for sharing their spaces and their big ideas um, and their recollections with us this evening. I've learned so much and I've really enjoyed it. Um, and it's really taken me outside my own space tonight and I hope it has for you too. So I want to thank Mike Stratton, Cordelia Langford, Siggy Nepp, Jeff Barrett and Jeremy Farrer and I also want to make a special mention uh, for Beth Elliott, the curator who's brought all of this together. But I also want to thank uh, you at home, uh, viewers and, and listeners who have shared your evening with us and shared your space with us this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And now I'm going to hand back to Julian who would like to say a final word. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and the only person that Angina did not 
thank is herself. So I will do that. So huge thanks to you for your expert chairing and navigating us through 30 years of amazing history. And also my personal thanks to Mike, Cordelia, Siggy, Jeff and Jeremy for their inspiring contributions to the discussion tonight. Um, as Angina said, I hope everyone at home enjoyed it as much as we did. I think there were just really fascinating themes here about the importance of physical spaces for science and creativity, how long-term investment in research paved the way for our ability to respond to the global pandemic, how large-scale and open collaboration can attack, can attack incredibly big problems, all the way from the Human Genome pro Project to the pandemic that we're currently experiencing, and the importance of open data sharing as a golden thread for the campus now and in the future. And I'd also add on a personal level, the importance of openness more general. Genomics matters to all of us. It's relevant to all of our individual pasts, our presents and our futures. And at Connecting Science is our commitment to make that science as open and accessible to everyone we can through events like this and many others. As is always the case, there were many questions, more than we could get through in the time, but hopefully we managed to cover lots of the themes you wanted to hear more about. And if you enjoyed this, please, if you enjoyed this and want to catch up on the series, my colleague will paste links in the chat to the other two recordings in this uh, series about the scientific history of Hingston Hall. I'd also really encourage you to explore the Georgians Jet Engines and Genes exhibition online at the Genome Gallery, which explores many of the areas we've touched on tonight in more detail. We really hope to welcome you back to our gallery and campus experiences in person before too long. But in the meantime, please do check our website, at the bottom of the page, you can also sign up to our events new newsletter to keep informed about future events. And we'll put links in the chat to useful resources connected to the panel in our discussions tonight. And finally, we'll also post a short survey. Please, if you can, stay online just for a minute to um, answer that survey, because we'd really love to hear your feedback. It helps us improve future events. This event will be recorded and um, be uh, available on the Genome Gallery website in a few days time. So if you want to watch it again or share it with your friends, you can see it there on the Genome Gallery website. So that's it. Huge thank you to all of our participants, to everyone for joining. Take care, stay safe wherever you are and see you again soon. <laughs>